And we're recording. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Glad to have you all with us this afternoon for the Society of Agricultural Communications Scholars webinar here in November. And we have a, a really good uh, topic and presentation today by David Dorford at Texas Tech University entitled Developing Your Research Program. And so I'm gonna turn it over to David in just a second. As you all who are been here before, no, the kind of the, the format is uh, after David's presentation and he can decide whether he would like to have questions throughout or at the end. Uh, we'll have a time for uh, all of us to, uh, to share what's going on in our universities if there's any announcements we'd like to make as well. And so uh, this was the last uh, presentation for this uh, academic year, well, the, the calendar year, uh, and then we'll pick up again in the spring. So again, uh, David Dorfer, we're gonna turn it over to you for your presentation this afternoon. Thank you, thank you. And, and instead of questions, Ricky, I like to just call on people to see if they're awake and paying attention. So Nellie, you're likely to be called on just so you're aware. Uh, with that, I'm let me share my- early, So I'm gonna scoot out before you're able to. So ask early. Well, then maybe I should start now. <laughs> All right, let me share a screen, go through a few slides for you, talk a little bit about how, um, as I have approached my own research program development, but then also as I've worked with others as a mentoring role to try to walk through uh, them creating a research program as well. And so with that, I'll share screen and we'll go from here. Um, if you're at an R1 or an R2 uh, university, uh, where you have a doctoral research program, you have probably figured out that you're expected to do some sort of contribution to the university itself. Usually it's related to research and creative scholarship. And normally this is embedded into promotion and tenure policies. But uh, not every, obviously, ag com faculty position has to worry about this kind of stuff. So Hopefully this is beneficial to all of you, but I'm gonna walk through it from the idea that uh, you do have doctoral research at your university and this is a deal for you to, to work on. But this is gonna be a brief introduction. Uh, Nellie knows as, as we've talked through things with her developing a research program that this is a process. It's a conversation that goes on uh, and can evolve throughout your career as I continue to still evolve my research program as Technology has changed, policy is changing, and even funding opportunities have changed. So where I start from is with Boyer's report from 1990. And if you haven't had this as, as one of your courses, this was a, a report that he authored called Scholarship Reconsidered Priorities for the Professoriate. Uh, there have been a few books since then. And these are two that I have in my library that I draw upon the one on the left, the scholarship reconsidered uh, is probably the better of the two uh, when it comes to understanding the areas and how they unfold. But the second one gets into maybe how universities are starting to evolve and consider these four areas <clears throat> more as equal. If you haven't heard of this before, um, let me go through the four areas and skip the slide there. These are the four. Uh, discovery, teaching and learning, engagement and integration. Let me give you just a little bit about each one of these because obviously they've written a whole lot more about them. The discovery uh, focus area is really the traditional research focus. It's about transforming problems and questions. Uh, it's also about sharing. It's about sharing your results uh, your discoveries through scholarly publication. <clears throat> then there's the teaching and learning focus from Boyer. This involves things like innovative approaches, best practices, perhaps even theory and frameworks that evolve out of your research related to teaching and learning. And this becomes very important as a form of scholarship as well. Engagement, and this, Ricky, might be where I'm tying in the, the point that you wanted to have tied in before. Um, and we're seeing this term more. Some universities, some maybe still do, call it service. Some will call it outreach. 
But the term is evolving more to engagement and viewing it more as a partnership, perhaps with field base or action research tied to it. Uh, some will refer to this as the scholarship of application. But for the most part, we're seeing increasingly the work of working out with the field. Now, land grant universities, this has really been your mission since forever. But we haven't always included it in the promotion and tenure process. And we're starting to see more of that with some universities uh, really transforming themselves, including here at Texas Tech, where we have an office of outreach and engagement and faculty submit an annual report of activities. And so we're tracking it a lot more here. The fourth and final area, if my screen transitions here, is integration. Some of you may have heard uh, interdisciplinary research in your universities or, or transdisciplinary teaching. This is really the fourth area of Boyers, and it's the idea of not just working with other disciplines, which would be called multidisciplinary research or te multidisciplinary teaching, but actually working together and sharing results to come up with conclusions together, not separately. So this is the fourth area that's kind of emerging more at universities. Uh, for the most part, we've seen interdisciplinary research and teaching at R2 and lower level universities on the Carnegie uh, classification, but we're starting to see more of this at the R1 universities. So what's expected when you have to create your research plan? Uh, for those who are beginning ones on, on the call here, the first step that I walk our beginning faculty through is our own policy uh, related to P&T. And it's going to be a mess, folks. Uh, I put up here the next two slides just to show how Texas Tech handles this. We have criteria at the university level, and we have criteria at the college level. And they're not always complete mirrors of each other. There are some departures that go on. So as you think about developing your research program, you have to really start with understanding the criteria at all the levels that are going to impact you as you go forward as a faculty member. And then, for example, on the teaching related, TTU has a general criteria that is the same for associate uh, professors going uh, receiving tenure and those who are going up to full. But then the college, Kasner, has some differences. Now you'll see here within the in the TTU criteria things like designing courses, textbooks, articles, uh, new instructional materials. All of these things contribute under scholarship for teaching and learning. Here, it may not be the case at your university. So my point with this two slides here is you've got to start with what's expected. Know what's expected of you. Because if you understand the road ahead, you can best prepare your plan. So let's go on from here. And I would encourage you, and I start all the people I work with, with what's the end you want to get to? What's that end point? And sometimes it's uh, as simple as building on your experiences and interests. And what is the kind of thing that you want to do for the rest of your career? What is the thing that interests you? Uh, is it like Dr. Rollbeck here who is interested in video production, or Lindsay Kennedy who works with photography, or Courtney Myers who works with uh, social media? What is it that really interests you and that you want to focus on? You might also ask, where's the money? Because if you're at an R1 or an R2, you're expected to do a little bit of grant writing. Uh, and so that expectations out there. And if there's no one funding your interest area, you really got to take that step back, maybe that pause of saying, do I really want to do my research program in here if I'm going to struggle securing resources? Now, if you got a boatload of money like they do at Virginia Tech, you just walk into Tracy Rutherford's office and you say, hey, I want to do this. And she hands you the money. Uh, the rest of us, not so much. We have to work at it a little bit more. Uh, then certainly think about the four forms of scholarship here. Some of you 
maybe have a higher teaching and learning appointment, you might want to think about your program having a little heavier emphasis on that. But if you have a stronger research appointment, maybe you want to focus on the discovery area. And then here's the kicker, folks. There's no template here. All right. It's not like the STEM areas, which for years you would start in someone's lab and you started that way as a doctoral student. When you applied to the university, you said, I want to work with this PI, I want to work in their lab, and I want to learn this area of research. We don't typically do that in our doctoral programs. And once you get to your university, you have a great deal of flexibility to kind of choose. As such, a research program uh, development plan varies a great deal as well. But here's what I would recommend to you. Can you maybe put two of these areas together? And this is where I've kind of worked my program of my research relating to my teaching and learning and my teaching and learning relating back to my research. If you're a basketball fan, Mike Krzyzewski at Duke says, two are better than one if two act as one. And so that's a key element here with maybe thinking about more than one of Boyer's four areas. Can I merge those together? And we have one faculty member here, a new faculty member who's kind of doing three by adding engagement to this as well. So his research program is really starting to evolve with three of Boyer's areas. Now, start with where you wanna go. If, what do you wanna be known for? Do you wanna be uh, the Dr. Courtney Myers who is known for doing research related to social media or the Erica Erlbeck who's done things in video? Or is there some other area you wanna to go to? Maybe some focus line of questioning you wanna to get to. Maybe that's what drove you to become a faculty member. Uh, or maybe start smaller. Like, where do you want to be in five years? What will the focus be? To what extent are you integrating this into your classes as a beginning faculty member? What do you want to be known for in a profession? And who are you going to collaborate with as you go down the road? So think about these things as you're starting to narrow down my focus area. So if you're starting with discovery and teaching and learning coming together, what do you want to be known for at the end? Now, here's where I started in 2002. Um, so long time ago, uh, I came up and I started with two goals for my research program. Uh, one was working with agricultural water management and conservation. Here in West Texas, big deal, folks, because we don't have surface water. We basically have groundwater, which we are mining and the resources declining. The other thing I focused on is science communication. How do we share information? How do agriculture and other stakeholders receive it? How do they use it for their decision making? These things related into my classes as I was teaching a graduate class on knowledge management, and I was teaching the our intro class on scientific communication. So those were important courses. So I had both the discovery aspect of doing research related to this and the different stakeholders, but I was also doing stuff with my courses and how students were developing in these areas. So I was integrating the two very intentionally. From here, if my slide flips, I created a sequence here a set of tiers to get me to that end point. And so if you took the water related goal I had for my first one, I kind of worked backwards because you can't necessarily know what the first step is, but I knew what my last step was by getting the goal. And so to get there, I wanted to assess strategies for effective sharing of information for water management. Well, to do that, I had to develop and test strategies. Well, to develop strategies, I needed to know the factors that influence decision making. And then to know that, I needed to know where we were now. And so I built a program based on four tiers to get me to that end point. Now, I put there the number three to five. You can vary that greatly. It doesn't have to be that number. Maybe you're going to come up with six. Maybe three is your number. 
Uh, Nelly, I'll ask you since you're still on, where are you at right now for number of tiers for yours? I think I'm at three tiers right now. Okay. And they get more complicated as we go on, but <laughs> yes, three. Well, and they're not locked in stone. And that's a key thing to remember, folks. Start with it, kind of outline it, and work your way through it. Okay, so I had my goals. I developed tiers to get to that goal. From there, I had to do a little bit more connecting the dots within each one of those tiers. And so with that, I took and created objectives within each tier. Now, this is my first tier. And I developed four objectives in there that I worked through to achieve what I had there for that first tier. Now, you'll also see I used a little bit of color. You know, you got, we're ag communicators, folks. We got to integrate a little bit of design onto this. So I kind of thought through what are my stakeholders? Who am I going to, who's my audience when I'm going to research? What's my population? Where am I going to draw samples from? And so I did a little color coding. You'll see my key at the bottom of the slide there. Green is for producers, purple was educator, red was media, blue is public, and in black was multiple audiences. So as you look at each one of these, objective B included both public and producer audiences. And this was very helpful to me as I would glance at it, and I'll explain what else benefit it also provided going forward here. Let me pause and see if there's any questions at this structuring point. Not seeing any, Ricky. Looks like I should keep going. I agree. All right. So now I embellished it a little bit. I had objectives here. I started thinking, where could I see funding from? And so you'll see I have a column I've added to. It's all funding. And CASNR is our college, and, and they had some development funds for launching new research. So that was a choice. USDA has had several areas related to uh, water, water management, water quantity, and conservation. And so I had options there. Uh, in Texas, we had a water development board that also did grants. And then there was also an Ogallala initiative. Uh, Jason might be aware of this. It includes uh, Kansas, Texas, and Oklahoma as possible places where you could get funding. I also put a bit of a timeline there of what would it take me to get through all of these objectives. And so that helped me kind of do a little bit of planning. So as you think through the four tiers I had outlined, I had funding and timeline and objectives for all of those as I fleshed out my plan. Now, I work that way. I know there are some people who are drawers and just as soon grab that cocktail napkin in a bar at a happy hour and lay it out. Uh, I'm happy to help with that at even the location, but whatever it takes for you to lay out your plan, think about it, work through it, and realize that you can change things as you go along. All right, so I laid out my plan. How did I use this with my graduate students? Well, first and foremost, folks, you need to use this working with your graduate students. We have a tendency in agricultural communications and maybe our, our broader uh, discipline with ag ed and ag leadership of when a student comes in and they have an interest area, we depart from our research program to go do their research topic. And to a degree that can dilute our program and in essence weaken our efforts a little bit as we go forward on promotion and tenure. Now, other disciplines, especially in the STEM area, if you want to study something in that PI's lab, you're doing it what their program is. When my son chose to go to Rice for graduate school, he basically looked through the labs and he had to indicate which PIs he wanted to do research in. They even have then the admission process to help define what research you're doing. 
we don't typically take it to that level, though perhaps we should. So once I had my plan, I would basically put it in front of my graduate students and said, okay, which topic do you want to work on? And if they told me they wanted to do a different topic, I would tell them that you know, maybe Dr. Rayfield needs to be your chair because that's his topic area, it's not mine. And that helped keep my research program a lot more focused going forward. Now that's a big decision, folks, that's a big effort because when a student comes to us and wants to work with us, we often see that as very complementary to us, but not maybe also the best interest for our future. All right, so, how do I know I'm going forward? How does my boss know I'm going forward? How does Jason Ellis gonna know that Nellie's doing a good job on her research program? Well, make it part of your annual review. And so when I would sit down with Matt Baker, who was my chair first, and then Steve Fraze, and now Scott Burris, I basically show them, here's where I'm at. I help show them my plan. I show them the progress I've made. The other thing to remember with that is they can help you back. And so when Nellie shares her plan with Jason, Jason's gonna know people who maybe have some resources for her or some connections for her to make. It allows him as chair to share back to her and hopefully mentor her then through her program on through the promotion and tenure process. And if Jason recommends any changes or suggestions, Nellie can go back and make the changes. And so it's not locked into stone, folks. You can make the changes based on feedback and how things change around you. Now, for example, here was mine on tier one. Uh, and this was, uh, I think, two years, three years in uh, on my tier one. And so you could see on each objective, I had where we were at. I'll give you a couple of extra suggestions here as well. Uh, don't be afraid to, once you've got your plan, to look out for consultants, mentors in that area. Now, they may be outside of agricultural communications, and that's okay. But if you're always citing somebody in your research, why don't you pick up the phone, give them a call, send them an email? You know, you'd be surprised how many of them might be willing to help you, give you some insight, because they started the same way. They had to create their research program, too. I would also encourage you to see uh, who were funded in your research program. And normally you could see topics, especially out of agencies like USDA, who got funded. And if it's related to your topic, you might want to reach out to them. I've even had some, as I've reached out to them, uh, be willing to bring me in on their projects. They've reviewed manuscripts for me and even funding proposals uh, for me before I actually submitted them. And I always have to encourage, take courses, take professional development on grant writing and whatever else kind of things. But my point through all of this today is that really, this is a process. It takes a lot of things. And I would argue that the core values, core characteristics of a scholar are integrity, perseverance, commitment, and courage. And if you keep working on a program, you keep managing your progress on your program, and you keep your program up to date and continue to inform and work with your chair and others who can help you through this, you're going to eventually be successful with your research program. And then don't be afraid to reach out to those who are in the profession. You know, Nellie, for example, while she was a, a graduate student here, she's at Kansas State, but that doesn't mean we don't stay connected. Uh, and most of us on this call who are faculty do connect with each other and we do share and work collaboratively with each other. So don't be afraid to reach out as you're developing your program. And for those of you who are new, if you want to share drafts with me, I'll offer up to you that I'm willing to review those as well.
So with that, Ricky, I'm going to pause my share. Um, Jason's got a, a point in the chat. Jason, you want to elaborate on your point? Yeah, so under Ricky's guidance, I think he's still the spearhead of this, but there's a mentoring program that's been established for faculty to get them connected to other faculty. It doesn't have to be senior to junior. It can be peer to peer uh, to be able to have conversations working through these. And I know I've worked with a couple of different faculty um, in this avenue, and they're great conversations for me as well, just to get different thoughts and ideas from their perspective of where they're at coming up through ranks at, at other institutions as well. Before we get to questions, perhaps some of the more senior faculty on the call could share how they got their research program started. I'll call on Dr. Uh, Earlbeck because I've been using her name in vain during my presentation. And uh, sorry, I joined late because uh, we had to meet with Jet's teacher this morning, this afternoon. <laughs> Starting my research program, I it was a shotgun approach. It was um, I said yes to everything. And uh, that wasn't the best approach because I felt very stressed out. And then when I look back at my CV, it's really all over the place. And, uh, but I also think you need to do that a little bit to figure out what it is that you really like. Um, so, or don't like, like, it took me a little while to figure out, like, even though, cause when I first started in, uh, in my faculty role, social media was a new pretty toy. And uh, after a while I was like, you know what? I really don't love this topic. So, um, but you know, I needed to do some studies to, to figure that out. So I don't know, no regrets, I guess. I think Tracy had started unmuting it about that time. So I'd say it was lots of conversations with senior faculty in my department and looking at what their CVs look like, knowing that that's where I needed to be tenured and kind of having that conversation about how tight does your research need to be early versus how broad can you be to kind of figure out where you want to go? Um, I know that's a big conversation that we have here is if it looks like you were scattered starting out, that's actually viewed relatively negatively, unless you can make the case as to, I was looking at this new technology and then moved into the area that I'm moving into now. Um, we, you know, then we, you know, you get creative having conversations on buses, right, Dorfert? <laughs> I was thinking of that uh, exactly. Uh, for those of you who don't understand the reference, uh, we were on an ACE tour bus years ago, and I was talking with Jim Evans about my risk and crisis communication class, and I said I'd like to think about how I could better get the students to feel the effective or emotional side of crisis and everything else. And Tracy in the seat next door, who uh, just happened to be lurking and listening, uh, said, well, have you thought about Second Life? I, I had not heard of Second Life. And so Tracy explained it. Well, we ended up collaborating and getting a USDA grant to test Second Life as a way to teach crisis communication. So uh, not only did it then relate to my goal of science communication and, and adding that into my teaching and learning, but certainly uh, how we get about prepping students for different things came into play. So we tried a couple other little efforts after that. We didn't have the same success, but uh, it was just a, a conversation with peers in the profession that turned into a grant proposal. Which I don't know if you know, David, that that has rolled over to vet med and they're still doing it. Are they? Yeah, they're still using our island and a lot of our scenarios and training uh, vet students third year vet students as part of their rotation to deal with crisis communication in things like tornadoes and hurricanes and fires. And so that's still going on from our project. Very cool. Uh, Lisa, you've, you've been in the profession a while. You started at another university and then moved. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how you developed your research program? Yeah, um, I, I'm probably guilty of uh, kind of like Erica said, just chasing rabbits for a long time and anything that looked shiny and interesting, uh, I kind of would just say, yeah, I'd love to be a part of that. And um, So I, I guess probably the biggest thing I've learned is to find good collaborators. Um, 
people who are doing work that you find interesting, like you talked about, you know, see if you, you can start and just play a small role in a project and show yourself and your work ethic and, and finding people who will do what they say they're going to do in the time frame they say they're going to do it because it can be really interesting, but if it never gets done, it's not going to help you towards your goals. So um, I think collaborators are really important. Uh, Kelsey, you were someone who's kind of kept your research program going a little bit off your dissertation. Yes. Yeah, so I knew probably 15 years ago, going to my master's, I wanted to focus on local food marketing issues for uh, farmers markets, farm stands, CSAs. And so it spun off of my dissertation work. And when I arrived in Utah, I realized that we had some faculty that did the economic feasibility of farmers selling at farm stands and CSAs and farmers markets and things, but they didn't look at the, the marketing and maybe the audience uh, analysis of how we can communicate and advertise and bring people to those um, businesses. So I collaborated actually more with uh, ag economics. And then as I started exploring farmers markets and audiences, I found this huge gap in SNAP education and SNAP ed shoppers. So probably for the last 10 years of my research here, I have focused on measuring the impacts and the creation of SNAP ed um, access to farmers markets, CSAs and farm stands, um, and even now into retail businesses in our state and trying to increase the number of local food businesses that do that. And most of my work there is collaborative. I'm the only agcom person. It's with nutrition, education, uh, faculty, dietitians, uh, SNAP education, uh, extension educators. And then we have a lot of partnerships in the state. You have to be willing to play with our state department of uh, workforce services and our state department of health and even our state board of education because I do some work with farm to school on that. And so my focus has really been like heavily, I would say probably 90% of my work is on that uh, local food marketing and 10% is on teaching and scholarship of learning. And what I've done is I've taken my extension programming and my research on marketing and communications and has tied it into teaching how to do that to my students and then coming off with projects um, that get them involved, maybe looking at marketing plans or social media marketing plans that they could be doing for the, the farmers and tying in now with Katie and what she's doing at K-State in a similar role like that. So mine is probably different in that I was been very focused and probably not, I would say one regret I have is I haven't collaborated enough or as much as I should have with agricultural communication faculty. I do miss that. And researching within AgCom, um, so much of my work is within nutrition education now. Um, but I love it, and I have actually found a place where AgCom belongs in that area. Um, but I do miss that a little bit in my discipline. Jason, I'm going to ask you a question to chime in here. Uh, from your role as a chair and doing annual reviews with faculty, what are some of the things you see as good things with research programs that should be encouraged and some things that you have to usually advise a faculty member on a little bit more? Uh, two things that come to mind in thinking through the process. Uh, one is looking kind of short term in terms of you've got a, especially if you're assistant professor, you've got that, what, six year roughly probationary period. And so you have that definite timeline that you need to work to accomplish those goals of uh, promotion and tenure unless you want to move on. Um, and as, as David talked about too, so you, you need to look at your productivity, you're producing those works, how you make that, that process continue to, to create those outputs, but then also how does that fit into a, a bigger process and that long-term goal? So you may have a 
much bigger philosophical direction of your research program in that stage. And that's good. And you're probably looking at external funding and it may take a little while to get the funding and then get the work and then get those projects or uh, papers and outputs and outcomes coming off of that work. But at the same time, you're also going to be needing to have uh, products coming out or meeting those annual up to those six year requirements that your institution or your department has for promotion and tenure. So it's it's almost kind of a two phase. You've kind of got the marathon approach of what's your long term research and where's that trajectory taking you. But then also you're having those smaller pieces and parts coming off of it. And those smaller maybe what some of you might be when you refer to kind of the shotgun approach. Um, having some of those other projects that may be more ancillary to what your bigger goals and initiatives are, um, or depending on who's reviewing the materials, they may not appear to be related. So as Tracy said, you've got to, you've got to talk about that relationship and how there's a, a thread that's woven through those elements on your documents. Um, but, but having those pieces there, because it's one thing to just have a whole bunch of those little things coming out and then it can have the, the appearance that, well, you can't stick with anything and you have no real direction that you're going and you're gonna do what Erica said of chasing the next shiny thing. Um, but then if you have the big piece, then you're not gonna have any outputs coming off of that. Um, like you got a great idea, but you're never making any progress towards that as well. So kind of doing an annual check-in of where are you being successful in working with mentors, getting engaged in funding proposals and other things for that bigger piece but also what do you have that's going on and what are you being able to produce that's coming out on a shorter term basis? And I think that's where uh, elements like the, the scholarship of the teaching and learning can help on those shorter term, it's still inquiry-based uh, research that's coming out on the learning process. And then you can also contribute to those bigger research initiatives on the side that you're engaged in the funding piece um, you're engaged in the publication piece, et cetera, coming out. So, and different, especially on the funding side, different institutions and even different departments have different requirements on that one. The publishing and the output side of conducting the research is, and eh, there's, there's variations, but that's a little bit more of a common one. Um, I served on our College of Agriculture's promotion and tenure committee for three years and it was interesting to learn because like agricultural economics does not have an expectation of their assistant professors to secure external funding in going up for promotion and tenure. They want them to get the research plan, the research program established. Then they can start to pursue the extramural funding to help support that. They provide a little bit more from an internal funding, startup monies, et cetera, during that probationary period. And then you can go after the, get some of that groundwork and go after the extramural funding, you know, towards the end of your five or six years as an assistant professor moving into that associate professor level. That's why you got to understand the policies there because they vary from place to place. Exactly. For our, our newer faculty on the call, as well as our graduate students, what questions do you have to ask of, of the process in creating a plan that maybe we can all chime in on? So I guess just maybe some clarification, um, because I am new and I have jumped from one university to another um, where I didn't have really a research appointment. And so um, now I'm at New Mexico State University where there is that research expectation. When we look at my CV, right, there might be a little bit of a gap. And then as I'm like starting to get started, part of that is going to have to be like, hey, I want to be on any project to get my roots here in New Mexico to kind of like get, you know, <laughs> that train rolling. So it, it doesn't look terrible, right? I, I guess Dr. Rutherford, as I can like explain that to somebody to say, hey, here what was the situation and explaining how I kind of grew as a faculty member through that experience. Like, I guess as I go up for, you know, review, I just have to be prepared. Is that kind of what I'm taking from this is that, you know, each of our stories is different, but if I can explain where I came from and kind of how I grew and learned from that, like I'll be all right. <laughs> well, one, one of the things to check on, and, and Jason, Tracy, Ricky, please chime in on this as well, 
is different universities will count your previous positions differently. Some will have you when you come in start over at zero. And so the previous work really doesn't matter. Uh, they want to know what you're doing there for them. Others will give you partial credit, maybe one year off the tenure clock for you. But if, if you hadn't done anything publishing wise, and now you're in a position where you have to publish, it might be better for you to start with the clock reset at zero versus trying to bring in that extra time. Uh, Jason, Tracy, I see a little bit of head nodding going on there, or either that or my eyes are bobbling. Uh, what, what say you? I'd say the same thing. And here, like you'd have to have significant experience to bring anything in with you anyway. Um, and so really they're looking at what have you done? It's kind of that, what have you done for me lately at the institution that you're in? Because that's what counts for us is what you've done when you've got New Mexico State after your name versus your previous institution. So they're also gonna be able to see things like your previous teaching load, which was extremely heavy. Your previous appointment was not a research appointment. So those are things that are in your document that explain that previous position. If somebody's digging that deep, most of them are not gonna dig that deep because you weren't there for a long time. Lisa, I see your hand up. Lisa, I had a, um, when I was at LSU and uh, as an assistant professor, we had to meet with our tenured faculty every year and get like oral feedback on where we were. And it was kind of, it was kind of an intimidating process, but I did get some helpful feedback. Um, and there was, a, I remember there was a full professor there that, and he would reiterate this over and over again, that what they're really looking for is trajectory. And that really was helpful to me because I always had kind of thought about like the focus being on what you had done. And it kind of helped me shift my focus to like, not that that's not important, but demonstrating what you're going to do. Um, and so I think if you can show kind of like an upward trajectory, not just in quantity, but like, are you getting more refined in your focus? Are you getting more opportunities for funding? Are you building a kind of a network of collaborators? Are you publishing in higher tier journals, like all of those things to show that you're on an upward trajectory with your research. Um, that, that was helpful to me to think about kind of that different mindset. Jason, I see your hand up. Yeah, one thing if you're looking to transition is in that process, having a conversation about the documentation of that previous work. Um, let me back that. Documentation about how that previous work may or may not count. Um, sometimes it's better to leave it out of the letter because if, depending how it's worded in the letter, like the offer or the contract or whatever it is, um, it can bind you to that time. Um, so to the, Lacey, to your example from previous work with teaching primarily, if you're bound to that, but then you don't get things up and going, okay, you've already committed to using one year or two years or three years of prior work. Well, that's already shortened your new clock by one, two, or three years. And so if you run into hurdles or elements, and so one of the things we've done is we talk about it, but we don't put any formal element of three years of your prior work will be used towards your promotion and tenure, because that right there says you've got to get stuff up and going in three years here. And so you don't have as much flexibility of all right, this first year didn't go so well, so I need an extra year, so I don't want to pull in another year. And I think to the, the conversation, that Tracy, you mentioned about the change of appointments um, on our cover form, it asks about what is the average of your appointment during that probationary period. Um, and so you can specifically put, you know, the average was, 50% teaching. Well, over three years, it was 100%, and three years, it was 0%. So, and then that's up to kind of, in ours, at least an initial document is, what was the, um, the description of your role and responsibility and of the time that's being considered in that promotion and tenure packet? So that is where it should be very explicitly spelled out that three, I'm making this up, the three years of your time that was 100% teaching plus the three years of your time that was at a 70% teaching or a 50% teaching, 50% research, 
drastic change in appointment, therefore drastic change in expectations. But as you'll see, during that time you exceeded in the three years of teaching, during the time you exceeded in the 50-50 teaching research. So really dividing those two and, and having the your department head or department chair talk about that in that initial document as well um, will be very important when you have those. And we even have faculty here that I, when I was on the committee that they had a big shift in their appointment. They never left the institution. They came at K-State as like a heavy extension. And during their appointment that they were here, they really shifted to a heavy teaching or something along those lines. So it doesn't mean you have to jump institutions to have those big changes, but, but be really articulate in what that shift was, what was done during that teaching appointment or that first appointment responsibility, what was done during that second responsibility, just to make it clear that Oh, you didn't have any publications your first three years. Uh, yeah, because I was 100% teaching. I'd still argue that scholarship of teaching and learning should necessitate your publishing as well. If you go back to Dr. Dorford's um, four points of what constitutes scholarship, publication is one of those, or dissemination is one of those. Even if you're 100% teaching, we're, we're in the professorial ranks at institutions of higher learning. So, therefore, we should be disseminating that out, even if we're doing if scholarship of teaching and learning is still scholarship and it's still research-based work and it if nothing is published did science ever happen if you don't get the paper out there what was the point of doing the work that you did and collecting information collecting data using that towards your towards your understanding and improvement of your instruction of your courses great question lacy other questions I have a question, um, Katie Burke, Kansas State. Thanks, Dr. Dorfer, for mentioning directing graduate student research. Uh, when I started, so I'm at, I'm around my three year mark. So I just went through my mid tenure review. Um, I've started advising more grad students and quickly realized that I'm stretched way too thin when I let them decide what their thesis is going to be about. Um, so I've already talked to Jason a bit about trying to focus and direct their work so that I we all benefit a little bit better that way, I think. Um, what are some other suggestions um, from the rest of the senior faculty about directing grad student work to be more aligned with what I'm working on and how, you know, how much rain do you give them? I would say my big mistake was in the recruiting. Like I recruited really good people. I didn't recruit people that wanted to work on what I wanted to work on in my early part of my career. And so there were great people that have gone on to be great faculty members, but probably until I got into like the fourth or fifth PhD student, it was referrals, not my active seeking and telling people this is what I'm looking for. This is the type of student that I want and how I'm going to fund them and whatever that's going to look like, but just kind of taking control of the recruitment process. And that's something we talk about with our faculty all the time here is we get really great students that apply. That doesn't mean we need to take all of them. We may not be the best place for them either. I, I would echo that. Um, when we get prospective students coming to visit, uh, my line of questioning with them typically gets to what are the interests in doing research. And uh, a most recent one was interested in the video imagery side of agricultural communications, as well as creativity. Well, my message to her is you need to talk to Dr. Gibson and Dr. Earlbeck and Dr. Kennedy, because those are the three who are focused on that area and they should be the people. So uh, to that point that, that Tracy just said, I think, you know, as a department should almost be a little bit of a team effort too. So if Jason is talking to someone, uh, he should be, uh, knowing what his different faculty are doing for programs and then try to do the connection. And I try to do the same thing as an instructor for our research methods class. When someone comes up and said, I want to research this, I say, well, you need to go talk to Dr. Rayfield because that's his area. I would, Other suggestions I would, I would, for Katie? I would, I would mention too that uh, depending on you're talking about a master's or a PhD student, PhD students may have more uh, idea about what they want to do. Master students, a lot of time, 
at least my experience has been, they don't have a clue, we're not all of them, but it's about what they want to do in terms of research. So, uh, so sometimes it's a matter of helping them, guiding them in, it's like, oh, you haven't thought about something. Well, here's what I do and try to move them there. But if, if your university is like ours, I mean, ours is a 32 hour program. So we don't have the master's students for very long, those who want to do a thesis. So for them, it's even more important to, uh, to try to get them to kind of move into an area that is of, of, of importance to you in, in research early on, uh, because that way you don't get into the situation with a, a, a student who doesn't have a really good idea of what he or she wants to do, you know, a year or two into their program. Thank you. We are at 3.52 Eastern time. We've got about five minutes left. Are there other questions or just general comments um, for David or for anyone here for that matter related to the topic of research? Uh, I'm, I'm very encouraged to see the number of folks on, on the call today who are in their first, second, or, or third years or doing, I mean, having to, to, to f figure this out, some of you on your own because you're in a very small department in terms of ag communication faculty. So as Jason said earlier, we do have a mentor program. We're trying to, to get that so that you can be partnered with uh, someone who may have a little bit more uh, experience uh, as well. So let me know if you're interested, if you're not already part of that process. Ricky, have... for those who are already a part of that process, um, we try to send out questions after each of these. Sometimes I just it takes me longer to get them done, but today I did them during the webinar. So we'll send those out. And I think this would actually be a really good webinar for you to discuss these questions with your mentor and any other questions that came up um, and get, you know, sometimes there might be things you feel uncomfortable asking at your institution, but maybe your mentor can think, help you think about how to ask those questions. Uh, my slide uh, handouts are, are in the chat, so you can download it there. And, and Ricky, I don't know if you want to attach it to the uh, file link once you yeah. uh, have the recording. Um, Good idea. But I'll, I'll, I'll echo what I had offered before. If you were working on developing your research program and like some feedback, I'm happy to assist. So feel free to reach out to me. Ricky, uh, I guess we need to chat about one thing with the people on the call. We're, we're still looking for one presenter in spring, aren't we? Uh, I had an email conversation with Erica. I think that we're, we're, we're getting close. All I right. So we might there. be full. So, so we're full. Yeah. All right. Any announcements for anybody? Let's first thank David for his presentation. So virtually or the little icon clap. Thank you very much. This is an important topic for everybody uh, as, as well. So if you weren't uh, on today and uh, then want to provide this information to graduate students, I think this is, again, very applicable in giving what Lisa also said about helping to develop questions for, for you and for your graduate students, too. So are there any announcements, anything that people need to share, want to share for the group? If anybody knows anybody in the ag ed teacher ed side that's looking for a heavy teaching position, send them my direction. We got a great position open. Great, great. Well, there are a lot of positions available right now. This is again a, a great opportunity, great time for for faculty and for new grad students to or older grad students about to, to finish out their program as well. Well, with that, I wanted to mention that, uh, again, we are not doing one in uh, December for the holidays. So on January 24th, roughly two months from now, Dwayne Cartmel will be uh, leading the, the discussion. The topic will be working with advisory councils and committees and also engaging external partnerships. So this is gonna be one that's gonna really focus on how do we work with external audiences and uh, advisory councils for our research, our teaching and our extension programs. So with that, uh, we're gonna be ending for the day. Thank you all very much. And again, thank you, David, for your presentation. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.